uh, this talk is titled Casinos, the new gold rush for developers, question uh, mark. First, a really good question. Why me? Uh, I'm currently CMO at Gamble Gaming, which is bringing uh, basically casual and arcade style games to land-based casinos and to mobile. Instead of traditional casino products like slots and stuff, we're taking games like people play on their phone and bring those onto the casino floor. So uh, I graduated high school at 14, massive nerd. Uh, spent over 20 years in the games industry. I've worked at places like EA, Rockstar, Activision, Scopely. Uh, I've been able to be on a lot of really great mobile games, console games, a lot of big brands. So so um, luckily I've had an awesome, uh, awesome career in the games industry and now for about a year and a half I've been sort of bridging the gap between the casino world uh, and the video game world. Uh, most importantly, I once played Mario Kart until 6 a.m. to get a gold on Rainbow Road 150cc. So I feel like that qualifies me for this talk more than anything. Um, first, let's talk about the size of the gaming industry uh, as they refer to it, uh, you know, the casino industry as people in, in our world might refer to it. It's massive. So right now the real money gaming industry is about $235 billion market, which is land-based and online. Uh, the lottery industry adds another $115 billion. Um, obviously, the social casino world is, is pretty small compared to that. Uh, you know, when you add all of it together, it's about $353 billion, not including daily fantasy sports and online poker. So it, it dwarfs most other industries uh, by, by quite a bit. Um, it's facing a major problem, which is there's no innovation in land-based casinos right now. Um, they uh, have stuck with slot machines that have you know, more or less had the same ga gameplay mechanic for the last 100 years, which is you sit there and you hit a button over and over. Um, and their innovations have come from big change beautiful curved screens and licenses like Bridesmaids and Ellen, but they haven't really done anything else to actually change the, the, the core of what the experience is for the user. So the demographic uh, in casinos is changing quite a bit. Right now, um, the average slots player is going to be female, uh, upwards of 50. The average age is something like 57, 58. Um, they're people who you know, traditionally didn't grow up with video games or mobile phones, um, versus the new market of casino visitors, is someone who's going to be 21 to 49, has good spending power, grew up with video games, grew up in arcades, uh, has a phone, plays all types of games. And when you start to look at the population estimates and then the top demographics of people who are actually going to land-based casinos, most of them fall into that 21 to 49 category. Now, when you look at slot play among that same demographic, you're looking at basically 2% of 21 to 34-year-olds actually engaging in slot play. So it's a really small percentage of people who have any interest in the product that's actually offered there. So this page is a whole bunch of fancy graphs to show you that basically this problem is not going away and it's actually getting worse year by year. And uh, the projections are that slot play will continue to go down, that the, uh, po the population base that's going to casinos is going to continually basically look for other forms of entertainment, things that bring them to those casinos uh, in, in the first place. So essentially, it's a, it's a pretty massive opportunity in a very established industry with a lot of money. So how are casinos actually getting people to still come? Well, they're doing things like big, crazy nightclubs with DJs, with amazing sound systems, systems, really crazy pool parties that I have gone to, and I have to tell you, the water is disgusting. You do not want to get into that pool unless you're really, really drunk. Um, cool shows like Cirque du Soleil, uh, you know, and again, it's a pretty large percentage of younger people that go to casinos, but very few that actually even gamble their entire trip that they're there. Um, however, things like barcades are doing really well. There's barcades opening up all over the world. There's quite a few where I live in Los Angeles that have opened up and will have long lines of an hour wait on weekends, and it's pinball and Street Fighter and all types of classic games with a bar, and it caters really well to that sort of 21 to 45, 49-year-old demo. Um, arcade chains like Dave & Buster's are growing. They're opening up about four locations a year in the U.S. alone, and that is video games and alcohol. Um, their number one source of revenue is actually coupon redemption games, which is basically gambling for, for everybody. Um, so obviously, it's a huge market. There's a lot of potential here. You know, when you look at just land-based casinos globally, it's $159 billion a year. Mobile games, as of last year, was $22 billion, right? So there's a lot more money flowing through this world. 
Um, Nevada sees about 42 million people a year coming to their casinos. Um, slot machine uh, revenue is down about 12.5% in the U.S. from 2007 to 2015. Um, so a lot of people, you know, that are actually playing slots are like Edith pictured there if you walk through. You know, it's a, it's a lot of people with uh, blue hair sitting there for hours on end and young people sort of walking by trying to get to, to the club. Um, casinos are really desperate for new types of content, new revenue streams, right? That's why now when you go, buffets, it used to be super cheap or expensive. Food's really expensive. A bottle of water is $5 at most casinos because they've had to go to different areas to start to generate that revenue that they're no longer making on gambling. The other big thing, especially places like in the U.S., uh, most uh, tribal casinos are now within a two-hour drive of where most Americans live. So the thrill of going to Vegas to gamble is, is not really the draw that it used to be. The cool thing about casinos as well, land-based casinos, is that your user acquisition is already done. The casino is already on the floor. The casino is already taking care of it. So you don't have to worry about a $25 CPI for a good user. And the average person on a casino floor tends to be what we would call a whale. So what are the difficulties? Um, I often make the face that Miss Perry is making here, which is there are a lot of difficulties in actually getting arcade-style games onto a casino floor. And there's a reason that not many people are trying to do it right now. Um, and it's an unproven market. No one really knows what type of games are actually going to be successful. Uh, that's the reason that you know, we're launching a bunch of different titles because we've got to figure out what are people actually going to play on the floor. We know what they play on their phones, we know what they play at home. What are they actually going to put money into on a casino floor? What companies that are trying to make skill, gamings are, uh, you know, skill games are actually going to make it? You know, there's a handful of us. There's probably three or four companies that are trying to do it right now. Uh, no one really knows who's actually going to make money, who's actually going to be successful at it. Will the slot companies come around and actually start creating skill content? You know, uh, they've been really slow to shift, as most major massive corporations and billion-dollar corporations are, and they've sort of been eyeing the market. But the difficulty they face is if they start making skill games now, they're going to eat into the market of selling slot machines. So they have to sort of tread carefully um, at G2E, which is uh, the world's biggest casino trade expo in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, they showed like one skill game, and so they're sort of putting their feet out there. But it feels kind of very early. It's a match three game. It's really simple. But if they do actually enter the market, they are, you know, behemoths. Um, licenses, if you want to go and get licensed to put a game out in a specific territory, for, for example, Nevada, New Jersey, that can be anywhere from 100000 to, you know, a million dollars per area just to get a license. So it's also a, a pricey proposition if you want to go and just make games yourself and put them out there, as opposed to the App Store, which is, you know, you can just basically throw stuff up there. So the money, as showcased by my cat friend here, is uh, seemingly right there for the taking, but not actually that easy to, to grab. Um, content. Right? Any, any new platform that lives or dies, really, it, it goes by content. And so what are the difficulties of getting content onto the floor? Well, we're all used to really fast updates. Server side, you see a problem in the game, you fix a bug, you want to put up some new content, great, super fast. Maybe you have an iTunes review, maybe it's something server side and it's updated in a few hours. Well, um, if you want to update something, you want to add a level, you want to change some content, guess what? You have to go through an entire regulatory review process, even if your game's already been on the floor for a year. That can take three, four, or five months to go through all of those channels to just get one simple update onto the floor. So it's one of the reasons that I often compare our business to like a 90s arcade, because we're sort of back in this sort of stone era where we don't have wireless connections and we can't connect to the internet. And you know, anytime you're dealing with people's money, you have to be really, really careful. And unfortunately, it adds time to everything. Um, regulatory reviews are pretty painful. Uh, most games have to go through somewhere between three and six months of regulatory reviews. And that's going to be different per region per territory, uh, and that includes things like actually you know, testing on the floor before you can make revenue. Uh, it's a pretty painful, um, time, time difficult process. Um, regulated hardware can be limiting, so uh, you're only allowed to use certain types of computers, certain types of devices with certain types of connections on the floor. So in other words, if you have a really beautiful game that requires an NVIDIA 1070 SLI mode with a you know, quad core CPU, they may not even make that type of device for the floor. So good luck. Um, IP that's too kitty can just be rejected outright if they feel it's appealing to kids. Now, all the games that we, that we make and put on the floor are in you know, age-regulated areas because it's gambling. So it's you know, 21 plus in most areas. Some areas it can be 18 plus. But if, for example, if we were to try to do a Mickey Mouse game, they might be like, nope, too kitty. You can't even put that on the floor. Every jurisdiction is handled differently. So 
uh, you know, Nevada New versus New Jersey versus California versus the different countries, right? Every country, every region has their own set of rules and regulations that your game has to apply to. So when you're creating something, you have to think about sort of the entire market and having sometimes different versions of each game that will work in, in certain regions. Um, the biggest question I probably get, well, if it's skill gaming, how do you prevent someone who's really good at the game from just sitting there and just earning cash and bankrupting you and bankrupting the casino? That's a fantastic question that we've had to think about for years and years. Uh, and, and the reality is, is that with every game that we make and develop, we have to come up with uh, different variations of how we implement gambling into the game so that someone who's really good can't sit there and just basically earn money. So what that means often is that a lot of times we'll come up with a series of challenges where the challenges uh, switch every time you play the game so that someone who is brand new, has never played the game before, can sit down and have fun and want to play again and not be like, oh, that sucked, I just lost all my money. And someone who's amazing at the game, who's been playing the game you know, at home, if the game exists in the home system, for a year can't sit there and make money. So you have to have a lot of random challenges. You have to do a lot of uh, things like using an RNG, a random number generator, to come up with prize payouts. So when the player is accomplishing certain things, there's an RNG that's figuring out, OK, they're doing uh, something that gives them a dollar this time, and next time it could give them $5. So you have to have certain elements of randomization sort of built into the, in the game from, from day one. Um, so that stack of cash, not as easy to get as you would hope. And of course, what am I doing about it, right? I've thrown out how big the market is. I've sort of painted the picture of some of the difficulties. Um, we're basically doing a shotgun approach. We're trying a whole bunch of different stuff because we're not totally sure exactly what's going to work. Anybody who says, yes, this is the type of skill game that will be successful, is lying because no one, it's a new market, no one knows exactly what's going to take off. So we've got an interactive table called the Model G, which is basically two to four people. It's all multiplayer games. It's got drink holders. It's got USB chargers. You can sit there. You can have a drink. These are probably going to be located near bars and clubs and lounges where people already hang out. And it gives them a social, fun gaming experience. You can play a video game with your friends. You can win money. And you can kind of have more of a fun social experience than it's currently available on the floor. The TriStation is where all of our single player content right now, all of our partner content's going on. That's all single player games. Uh, we're coming up with a, a new way to do esports on the floor, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the VRC is how we're bringing uh, VR content onto the casino floor. Um, and we actually made a physical felt table version of our most popular game called Gamble Poker. So we're trying to innovate in the actual table game space, which also hasn't changed in about 100 years either. Um, I think that partner content is a better offering for customers on the floor than licensed content. So what I mean by that is when you take a movie franchise, uh, James Bond, uh, Bridesmaids, and you slap it on the slot machine, all right, you have some consumer recognition. Oh, I like that movie. I love The Walking Dead. But the game plays the same. If you did that with a video game, and it's a still it's a, a new video game, people are going to be like, oh, OK, that's, that's cool. But when I can take a partner game, so these are all, these are all people that we've, uh, we've done deals with that are developing um, basically gamblified versions of that hit game for the casino floor, I think that when the customer walks up and sort of sees, oh, hey, this is a game that I've been playing on my phone for, for four years with End of the Dead, for five years with Jetpack Joyride, for five years with Catapult King, they're going to have that recognition of like, oh, I know the gameplay. I know how to play this. When they walk up, the game is the same. It's still, we're not changing the core functions of the gameplay. We're just adding in challenges or adding ways for the players to, to, to win money into it. I think it's a much better proposition for someone who wants to try a new product on the floor with a game they already know, as opposed to having to learn something that's brand new and going, uh, I don't know, the skill gaming stuff. Let's just let's go get drunk at the bar instead. Um, Esports, oh my god, most overused term ever. Uh, it's constantly coming up when I meet with casinos all over the world. What are you doing about esports? Okay, so the reality of esports, in my opinion, it's really interesting to watch. It tends to be sort of a, a passive, not that involved thing. It tends to be a very young audience. It tends to skew heavily male. Um, I am a hardcore gamer. I've been playing games since I was five, and I love all kinds of video games, but my ass is not going to try to compete in a League of Legends tournament because I'm not 18, and I don't play it 14 hours a day. So I know right there, I can't compete in eSports. I might watch it, but I can't compete. So uh, we're trying to come up with a way of 
putting an eSports vibe on the floor, but something that anybody feels like they could, could compete in. So what we did is we basically came up with G-Sports. And essentially what it is, it takes that tri-station, which is already going to be on the floor at casinos all over the US and eventually all over the world. We add a controller in, we use the existing hardware, and we can put sort of current console, PC, PS4 type games on it. So the operator doesn't have to buy all new hardware. They don't have to invest in a whole bunch of expensive PCs on the floor. They don't have to put in new floor space, right? These are all the things that the casinos think about because they're always watching the bottom line as well. Uh, and it allows us to essentially take a game that we don't actually gamify, we don't modify, we just use the original version and we give like a sort of a three minute chunk and it's a timed uh, fee-based entry tournament system. So essentially if you're one of the top three people on the leaderboard for the set tournament time, let's say it's six hours, if you're in the top three, you're going to win the prize pool that's in there. And every time that you play, let's say it's 20 bucks an entry, every time that you play, that prize pool is going to go up. So it's really simple. If it's a game that I'm playing at home now, which Road Redemption's awesome. Uh, if you're playing at home on your PC and you go and you see it's the exact same game, you can play and try to compete. Um, we tested it with people uh, in, in Vegas and people loved it because it was just an experience that was really easy, very easy to understand. And hey, if you're in the top three, you get money. It's, it's kind of that straightforward. Um, so really, a lot, of the, a lot of time when people ask me, like, what will work? If it worked in a 1990s arcade, which is basically where I grew up, um, it will work, I think, on a casino floor. You know, that's, that's uh, sort of what we've, we've summarized so far. Stuff that's simple and quick to learn, stuff that uh, has a nice, compelling, sort of long to master type of gameplay, Mario Kart, Tetris, right, Street Fighter, that there's layers to it. But if you've never played before, you can walk up to it and just start playing. Things like that, I think, are gonna work really well. Um, there is no saving in casinos. You don't have an avatar, you don't have a login account, stuff like that just doesn't work, especially with a younger demographic. So games that are RPGs or Clash of Clans or anything like that, things that are really complicated, require long tutorials, a lot to learn, it's not gonna work. Maybe in five years when we have a more sophisticated hardware and more sophisticated audience who's used to it, but for now, uh, it, it's not gonna work in, in a land-based casino. Um, an example of a game that, that we've, we've taken over, worked with a partner and Gamblified is uh, Into the Dead. Into the Dead is an awesome running zombie shooter that I've been playing a ton. Uh, and uh, Pickpock is a fantastic developer based in New Zealand. And basically we've worked with them with their core team uh, to create a special version of the game where you're running forth and you're shooting zombies just like you do normally in the regular game, but instead you have a series of challenges. So in this, in this screenshot, in this example, uh, your challenges are you've got to um, jump over tw uh, 25 fences, you've got to rescue 10 dogs, and you've got to clear through three forests. Other challenges might be you've got to kill 100 zombies with a submachine gun. Um, you've got to pick up so many weapons, right? Every time you play, the challenges are different. The layout of the level is all random, so there's a whole bunch of different challenges. But for the player, um, as they go through, they're still playing the exact same game that they play at home, the difference being now they have specific goals that they're working towards, and they know if I get, this, if I get these challenges, I'm going to win X amount of dollars. So it's a very direct proposition for the player that keeps the original core gameplay um, the same. So basically, to, to summarize, you know, my, my vision for this, this whole world of skilled gaming that's, uh, that's blowing up all over is you basically combine an arcade with a casino floor, right? You bring that sort of uh, modern edge of gaming into a world that is very established but is lacking in innovation. Um, and you bring things like Mario Kart and Street Fighter uh, and just fun, simple, awesome games. And Lakitu here will help you make it rain. Um, all right, uh, with that, any questions and answers, and I'll probably give you Britney Spears' face if I get confused. <laughs> uh, aren't you afraid of alienating the older demographics by doing something that's skill-based? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, one of the cool things about our machines is that they're all multi-game machines. So that tri-station that, that, that you saw a picture of, um, we have uh, nine games running on it right now. It's going to launch with three. And they're all totally different experiences. So um, there, in theory, is something that appeals to everyone. If you want to shoot zombies in the face, um, great. That, that game's on there. Into the Dead is on there. If you want to match words, um, there's a game called Lucky Words. If you want to match cute, adorable creatures, uh, it's kind of a match three style game. We have a game called Match Revolution. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, I think it's important to give that wide range of experiences. And it's actually really funny because we had a lot of assumptions, you know, going into this of this type of person will like this type of thing. And when we were showing all our games at, at G2E last month in, in Vegas, um, one of my main hosts came up to me and she's like, oh my God, she's like, women love Into the Dead. I'm like, 
dude, like, I was sure that was, like, our core, like, nerd gamer headshot game. And she's like, no, no, like, women are coming up and saying, like, oh, I love Walking Dead. I want to play that game where you shoot the zombies. It helped that we had actual zombies from The Walking Dead, like, running around in makeup and trying to eat people. Um, so it was a good advertising ploy. But, yeah, I think, you know, once we actually get on the floor, we're just going to learn so much about the consumer and what they want. But I think offering different experiences is key to not alienating anybody on the floor. Hi. Uh, when you play slots, then you have a lot of spins. The player can make a new spin every two, three seconds. Yeah. So the sink is very high. Yeah. What happens in these kind of games? I mean, how do, do you define session? And yeah. Every bet, how do you deal with that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, the average slot machine pull, or now button press, is six seconds, right? So minimum bet tends to be, uh, you know, 50 cents, or was that 200 shekels, right, um, every six seconds. So uh, for, for us, it's trying to figure out um, what is that right bet amount for that game. So the games on the table, the multiplayer table, those average about uh, 60 seconds or so per round, and it's, you know, roughly going to start at probably like a $2 buy-in per person, right? So we can do the math out, and we can figure out, okay, so it's going to earn this much on average. Now, a game like into the dead, which could last three seconds if you're bad, or five minutes if you're amazing, is a really hard thing to figure out. Okay, so is our minimum bet a dollar? Is it five dollars? You know, where does it sort of fall in that line? So for each game right now, we're looking at different minimum bets, and then we're trying to find that that sort of magic cap on where is that that end of that experience that we know. Okay, after like five minutes, we've really got to up the zombie density because we can't let someone keep doing. Which, if you play the mobile version, it sort of works that way anyway, so it shouldn't be too foreign to the user. But I think the the core of it will be um, setting a higher minimum bet amount if a game is naturally a longer experience um, one putting arcade games in casino isn't kind of sorting sort of like creating a, a game center as if it was for kids except you're trying to target a totally different part of audience so last I checked I think the average age of a gamer is something like 38 or 39 and it skews more female than male across the world right and I think a lot of that is is thankfully to the advent of this guy being in everybody's phones and games that appeal to everybody. So no, I mean, we're definitely not making anything that appeals to kids. We're making things that appeal to people like myself who grew up playing video games who want that more kind of social interactive experience on, on the floor. All right, second question. I mean, I'm not too familiar with local casinos uh, or landline casinos, but do they have users that are coming back and forth day in, day out and, steep and, and keep gambling? And, and with that being said, you said that you're not having anything that is login based, so nothing yeah. that could try to get the user to come even more and more and more than he's already coming. Wouldn't making a combination of the two make you have the, the people that are coming anyways spend a lot more because they feel more connected to the place? Yeah, uh, the reality is um, getting younger people, there's a few questions there. So first off, like the whole like, why don't you have an account? Why don't you have a login? Um, if you look at player club cards, once you get below 40, the number of people who will sign up for a player club card at any casino pretty much throughout the world just drops because they don't want to sign up for a program. They don't want to, even with the, like, the rewards and they get free this and free that, they just don't do it. Um, and also the other part is it adds a whole other layer of regulatory complex and difficulty and things that for us we're focused on getting stuff to the floor, which we have stuff landing in, in the next few months um, throughout the U.S. So for us it's like get it on the floor. And I think probably a year and a half from now we'll add some kind of login. And yeah, absolutely. The more that you can sort of give that player more of that customized experience, um, certainly in the way you can communicate to them or email them when new games launch, absolutely the better but for us it's more important to get something on the on the floor first i think at most casinos now you know it's different in different regions the tribal versus the big vegas world you know where tribal you might have people going twice a month vegas you have people going maybe four times a year on average um so it's it's a different type of mentality in each location but again that's one of the reasons i think we're offering a huge range of experiences of here's your multiplayer drinking game and here's your like single player like i want to burn a few hours because i got home from the club and i'm, I'm not tired yet. Hi. Uh, how big a change in behavior would be considered a success? How big a change in behavior? Um, if we can get people under 40 routinely playing our games and gambling, massive success because they're not doing it now. 
I think it's going to, you know, I think it's going to be a build too. I think it's going to take a while for consumers to understand and hear about our product. I think it's going to take a while for them to start playing, getting comfortable with them. And then I, you know, I think it's just going to go like that because if you look at, you know, say look at the numbers of into the dead or catapult king, right? They have millions of players. We have Jetpack Joyride coming. That's been downloaded 350 million times. They've got 14 million monthly active users. It's crazy. So obviously it's a game that's super successful. So provided that we don't mess it up, we don't ruin the magic of Jetpack Joyride, um, I think that you know, we'll be able to give people an experience they already like and know how to play. And now we add gambling as a layer onto it and it's a, you know, it's a totally new experience for them. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you guys.